I am thankful that we can be here, we can worship the Lord. I'm thankful that we can continue our study in Romans chapter 14, our current sermon series, A Taste of Heaven on Earth. I'm thankful, even though my voice is a little bit bad, I didn't realize that it was like this until I started singing a little bit ago, because I haven't really talked that much yet this morning, and uh, I really don't feel that sick, but I'm having a hard time. I could barely sing the songs this morning, so... Just pray for me that I'm able to communicate because there's a lot of things I want to get excited and fired up about this morning. And uh, so just pray for that as we go through this today. But um, as I was thinking and preparing uh, for this passage this morning, and as I watched that video earlier this week that we just watched, do you understand this morning that through the church, God gives the world a taste of heaven on earth? Through the church, God gives the world a taste of heaven on earth. I, I was, I've been overwhelmed all week, even this morning, just thinking about what is happening all around the world today. I was thinking about all of the tribes and the tongues and the nations. Literally, it started last night as we were going to bed. People on the other side of the world were already waking up and having church. It's happening now. It will continue after we leave here. Do you understand how many different people, how many different nations, how many different tongues are all lifting their voices in praise to the Lord just like we did this morning? Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And they might not sing those exact words. They might not sing the same exact tune. But all around the world today, his name is being lifted on high. Man, I I was thinking this morning about the gospel that is being preached. And literally, the thousands of people that are going to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Do you understand that there are people all around this world today that are waking up and they're searching and they're hopeless and they're looking for answers and they're wondering why they were created and what they're doing here and what's going to happen when they die? What does eternity look like? Do you understand that people all around the world are asking those questions and they're showing up at churches all around the world where the gospel is being preached and they're going to hear about a God that loved them enough to send his son, Jesus, to go to a cross, and you can't work your way to heaven, and you can't be good enough to get to heaven. There's nothing that you can do, but you don't have to worry because it's already been done. It was finished when Jesus died and paid for our sins on the cross. Do you understand this morning, the people that are finding new life in Christ all around the world I think this morning about the miracles. Every time we sing that song, it is finished, it is done. I, oh man, I get fired up. Strongholds bowing to the Savior. Resurrection power over every circumstance. Think about the people around this world today that are going to show up and they're going to hear the truth of God's word preached. And they're going to find hope. They're going to find healing They're going to find forgiveness. I think about the marriages that are being saved today because of the truth of God's word and because of the forgiving power of Jesus. I think about those who are going to be set free from addictions, those who find new hope in Christ, that it doesn't matter what you're facing and what situation you're in. There's a God in heaven that is greater, and there is a power and a strength that is available. I think about wayward sons and daughters. I think about the prodigal sons, those who have wondered and who have strayed, who are going to come back and they're going to be received and they're going to find out that there's a God in heaven that's full of mercy and he welcomes his children back with open arms. You can never go too far from God. You can never stray too far from God. You're not in too big of an impossible situation for God. Our God is a miracle working God. (laughs) Praise the Lord, yes. That's happening all over the world today. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. You understand, we are a part of all of that. I got one story for you. Many of you know this story. It's my favorite story. It's one of my favorite uh, personal testimonies that I've ever heard. There's a man by the name of Thomas. He grew up in England. He goes to college. He graduates after four years of college and decides that he's going to take a one-year holiday. How many of you would like to take a one-year holiday? Man, who is able to do that? That sounds pretty awesome to me right there. He travels the world. He ends up in Thailand. He's at a bar. He sees this beautiful lady singing, and he falls in love with her on the spot. And three weeks later, they get married, and they don't even speak the same language. How many of you agree that's a recipe for disaster? 
That's not the kind of dating advice that I'm going to marry somebody you can't even communicate with. I mean, so they get married somewhere along the line. He's in China, and where the word of God is illegal, you know what? He's in a bookstore in China, and he finds a Bible somewhere along the line. I don't know all the different circumstances, but he and his wife end up in church in Thailand, and there's an American missionary there by the name of Michael Frederick, who our church supported, who's in Thailand, and he's preaching the gospel, and Tom Britton comes to trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior, and God works in his family and saves that marriage, even with all the impossible situations that were going on. And today, Thomas Britton and his his wife and his children are back in England in his own town, and he is pastoring a church, and God did a work and brought it all full circle. Do you understand that's what we're a part of today? The title of my message this morning is A Sacred Spirit. A Sacred Spirit. Do you feel the awesomeness of the church? Do, do you? When we sit and, and when we get Outside of our own thinking, outside of our own little world, outside of our own problems, do you see the magnificence and the awesomeness of what we are a part of today and who we are worshiping? By the way, miracles are happening here. Every bit of those things that we talked about takes place right here in Milton, Florida, at West Florida Baptist Church. When God's people gather together, I cannot wait for the beach baptisms that are coming up. I wish I could tell you some more stories of the miracles of transformation today, but you're going to have to just wait, and you're going to have to come, and you're going to have to hear those testimonies for yourself because God is doing a transforming work in hearts and lives right here at home in Milton, Florida, and we are a part of that. There is a sacred spirit that belongs to the church and it must be embraced and it must be protected. And I tell you this morning, if you don't feel the awesomeness of the church and the magnificence of who God is, I want to challenge you just to take a next step and to be open-minded and to see all of this differently. This isn't just something that we get to attend. And, and maybe some of you, even as we go through this passage and talk about some of these things, you might be sitting there and you might be tempted to think, yeah, it's really good that the church needs to hear this, man. And we kind of distance ourselves from it. But if you are here today and if you are a member of West Florida Baptist Church, we are the church. This is for all of us. This sacred spirit, it needs to be embraced. It needs to be protected. And we all have a role that we play in this. And that's what Romans 14 is all about. It's all about maintaining that spirit between the different pieces and the different people that God is molding together into one. Where his name can be lifted on high and he can be seen in great salvation, life-changing, transforming ways in the hearts and lives of people, and that's what Romans 14 is all about, maintaining that spirit between these different pieces and continuing to experience and even giving the world a little taste of heaven on earth. That's what we're a part of. So let's just jump right in today. Here's the first thing that I want us to see this morning. If we're going to maintain and protect and embrace this sacred spirit, we've got to think big. We've got to think big. I'm just going to give you a real brief recap here. In Romans 14, Paul is addressing division in the church at Rome between who he calls weak Christians and strong Christians, and the disagreements are not over the fundamentals of the faith. They are not over the black and white truth of God's word, what the Bible says is absolutely right, what the Bible says is absolutely wrong. They're, they're about personal convictions and personal matters that surround things that the Bible isn't 100% clear on, like meat and days and wine. Those are the three things that come up here in Romans chapter 14. So I want us to pick up in the middle of the passage. I don't normally do that. I know we start it in verse 16, but I'm going to actually start the message in verse 20. And I want to pick up in the middle of the passage because it gives us a great place to review and also to pick up the whole context of really where we're at and how this all fits together. Okay, so everybody look at verse 20 the very beginning of it, and I need you all to help me out this morning with the very first sentence in that verse, okay? So everybody got verse 20? If you need it up on the street, uh, screen, read that very first line with me. It says, everybody out loud, for meat destroy not the work of God. At the end of the chapter, Paul is speaking specifically to the strong believers. And the strong believers were going around basically telling the weak believers that 
Meat is no big deal. Meat is just meat. It's not what goes into the body that defiles the man. It's what comes out of the heart of the man that defiles him. Okay, So it's, it's what's in your heart that makes you good or that makes you evil or that puts you in a right relationship with God. So they're going around and they're saying, meat is no big deal. You know what Paul does? Paul turns this whole argument upside down against them in an awesome way that he, that he just has a way of doing because it's obviously the Holy Spirit and God that's doing it as he speaks through him. And what Paul does here is he says, you know what? You're 100% right. Meat is not a big deal. So stop making a big deal about it. <laughs> it's no big deal, so don't make a big deal. Are you willing to destroy the work of God over meat? And that is a wonderful question that all of us need to ask ourselves. Are we willing to destroy the work of God over things where maybe the Bible is not 100% clear? Paul's saying if it's not a big deal, stop making a big deal about it. But then he does what he does really well too because he goes on in the very next phrase. Look at verse 20. He says, for meat destroy not the work of God. And then what are the next five words that he says right after that? Everybody out loud, help me out. All things indeed are pure. This whole passage is like a little yo-yo that's going back and forth. And I know he's speaking directly to the strong here, but you cannot ignore the fact of what he's also saying. All things indeed are pure. The weak side needed to understand that, that meat is just meat and that those who were strong in their liberty are not wrong for what they're doing. Now, I know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about meat and days. We've already done that. And it makes sense in the context. We can all kind of understand that. But what is he talking about for us today? Even last week as uh, church got done, I didn't get into anything specific last week. Week number one, we kind of talked about some specifics. Last week, I didn't say anything, and I had somebody come up and ask me on the way out. It was a very, very nice question, and just like, what are some of the specific things that, that we're actually talking about here? And what I want us to understand, where, where the Bible is not clear, there's liberty. So what are some of the things that maybe the Bible does not spell out for us? The Bible doesn't spell out what you should wear to church. The Bible doesn't spell out what kind of music honors God the most or how much or how little we should celebrate Christmas and Easter or what kind of movies you watch or, or where you should go for your entertainment or how old your child should be when they get a phone and what apps you let them have on their phone. There's all kinds of things that we can disagree about. I, I was thinking about this. I was remembering back to actually a long, long, long time ago when I was young and a kid feeling older and older as the days go by. Some of you are like, you're still young, so just be quiet. Okay. I was remembering back to, honestly, when I was growing up, and there used to be a lot more people that made a really big deal about the Lord's Day, and you shouldn't mow your lawn on the Lord's Day. You shouldn't work on the Lord's Day. It's a holy day, one that you should uh, remember. Remember those days? How many of you remember those days where those were things that people talked about? And I think that we've gotten away from a lot of really good things and, and some good principles somewhere along the line as we go through this. But do you know what the Bible says about that stuff? A day is a day, as long as you're bringing honor and glory to the Lord. You know, it's so there's answers to that. I was thinking of even uh, one of the churches that my dad pastored inside the um, Constitution. It said that you could not use playing cards. So things that you would, because they would be associated with gambling and things like that. And my dad and his family, they loved to play hearts. And every time we had a family get together, they play hearts. And then they would fight over who's winning and who's losing and who's not playing the game the right way. It was awesome. And that's what we do. It got passed down to the next generation. And uh, I mean, that's like a big family tradition. And I remember when we went there and it was in their constitution and my dad was just like, to his credit, he's just like, it's no big deal. I just won't play cards though. And he didn't while he pastored that church. It was something that, but how many of you agree? These are kind of frivolous things that the Bible doesn't give us specifics on. All right. What about some other areas. How about some even bigger areas that we tend to talk about today? What about tattoos? What about long hair? What about alcohol? How many of you are starting to feel really, really uncomfortable right now? <laughs> that was the whole goal today. Yes, all of us should feel a little bit uncomfortable as we start going through this. Let's talk about tattoos. Who wants to talk about tattoos at church this morning? Okay. Yeah, there's some hands going back. Man, people have never been so eager to sit and to listen this morning. When you get into these issues, many people will go, the, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about tattoos. There's maybe 
One verse in the Old Testament that you could go to, Leviticus 19, 28, it says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And I've heard this argument growing up often, and people will go to that verse, and it spells it all out. But here's the problem. You know what the very verse right in front of that says? That if you're a guy, you shouldn't shave or trim up the sides of your hair. Have any of you ever seen those Orthodox Jews that have those, like, those big curls that are coming down the sides? Of, that's what we should all look like. If you're going to use that verse right there, then you got to back up. And that's why Paul talks a lot about in the New Testament about the Christ, the law is no longer void. It doesn't mean that it diminishes everything that he said in the Old Testament. It just means that he paid for our sins. We, we can't obey the law. We've been set free from the law because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Hey, you, you, you want a verse that will really blow your mind on the flip side of the tattoo things. I, I came across this a few weeks ago when I was studying and I had to do a double take. And then I Googled it. And sure enough, it, it shows up a lot in this whole tattoo debate. But I was going through Isaiah chapter 49. And in Isaiah 49, Israel was complaining that God had forgotten them. Okay, so they're, they're like, God, you've forgotten us. And you know what God says? How can I forget you? He says, can a nursing mother not have compassion on her child? And the answer to that is, of course not. She, she does not forget that child. And he says, yet will I not forget thee. And then in Isaiah 49, verse 16, go ahead and put that up on the screen. You should have it back there. Isaiah 49, he says this, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And I was getting ready to, I was just looking at this, and I was thinking about possibly using it on Wednesday night, and I didn't have time to fit it in, but I was just sitting there thinking, how in the world would you explain that in our world today, in our context? Like, he has this great, how could you explain that without saying it's, it's almost the idea as if we're tattooed into his hands? And I was like, I can't say that in church. We start backing up and we think, but here's the whole idea. You know what we do? Now all of a sudden we'll take a verse and a passage like this and we'll start talking about, well, is it really okay to have tattoos? Is it really not okay to have tattoos? And we forget about the whole picture that there is a God in heaven who will never forget you and he will never forget me. And even though it seems like you may be abandoned and it seems like you may be forsaken, you are not. You are loved by the creator and king of all the world. And we forget all about the context. And we bring it down into the here and now. So the question you've all been waiting for, should I get a tattoo? <laughs> you guys were like, you just gave yourself a really good point to get out of all this conversation, but I'm going to bring it right back up. Because I think the Bible gives us some direction on this. Look at the end of verse 20, okay? It says, for meat destroy not the work of God. And then it says, all things indeed are pure. And then it says... But if it is evil for that man who eateth, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So here's an answer. If God has not given you a clear conscience about getting a tattoo, then don't get a tattoo. I'll even go a little bit further. If you are growing up in a home where your mom and dad say, hey, I don't feel like you should get a tattoo. The Bible says to obey and honor your parents. I'm not saying you have to do that at 35, but while you live under their house, and under their rules, you should be respectful of that, and you should listen and not get a tattoo. Okay, now look at verse 21. It says, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Now, he's not saying that you shouldn't do those things. He's saying that you shouldn't do those things if they can cause other people to stumble or if they can cause other people to be made weak. And he's telling us that there's a whole lot of questions that we should ask ourselves before we do things because we want to make sure we're honoring and glorifying to God and not just living for ourselves and what we want to do. So I think there's some really good questions. Just Again, we're just using tattoos as an illustration. Why do you want it? A lot of times, a lot of time, do we want it just because it's a fad? Do we want it just because it's a, it's a cool thing that everybody else is doing? Hey, what, what are you going to get? What are you going to permanently place on your body? Now, to me, I, I was thinking about this this morning. If I got Alabama right here and Roll Tide right here, <laughs> and I started showing up in T-shirts every Sunday morning, and you know I put my arms out like this a lot, I'm going to lose half the church. I just know it. You guys are out. You're gone. It's over with. 
I know that's what's going to happen, so that would be foolish. So what are you going to get? What are you going to put on your body? Will it help or will it hurt your testimony? There are some really strong arguments to be made about a cross or verses and different things like that and how it gives people an opportunity to witness and to talk to other people. There, there's a whole lot of arguments that can be made along those, uh, along those lines. So will it help or will it hurt your testimony? Here's my own personal rule for my family. This is what I tell our kids sometimes when this comes up. Listen, while you're, I'm a clean cut kind of guy. Just I am. Look, I, look, I shave my beard every single week. That's just, that's just my wife. That's what she likes, okay? <laughs> So anyway, that's, I, that's just who we are, and I tell them, look, as long as you're on my payroll, if I'm paying for your phone, your gas, giving you a bed to sleep in, your food, all of those different things, listen, as long as you're doing that, I say no, and I say wait. And then I even add one extra thing. I was like, and really, you should wait till you get married, because when you get married, you two become one flesh. That's her body. That's your body. You guys are one. And if you all decide that that's what you want to do, and you love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, you know what it really comes back to? You know what hits me, what hits home with me when I think about my children, and I put it all into perspective, honestly, I could care less. What I really want is to make sure that their heart is passionate about living for God and serving God. There's a, I know I'm probably just going to talk about a lot of just personal things along these lines this morning. And I, don't, I want to be able to finish the passage, so I'll be mindful of that. But there's this song, uh, I think it's called Talking to Jesus. A guy named Brandon Lake sings it. And Brandon Lake's got like a man bun and longer hair and all those different things. And I'll be honest, too, when I, when I watch that video and I look at it, I'm looking at a younger generation that if I'm just being totally honest, I don't always relate to in every way. I mean, they just do things a little bit differently than I would do things. And he goes through this whole story, and he starts off about how his grandmother was talking to Jesus. And then his mom was talking to Jesus. And now he's talking to Jesus. And he talks about how he grew up and how he went to church and, and uh, how his grandmother took him to church and instilled some. And he even says in there, and she made me wear khaki pants and a polo shirt. And everybody laughs in the video. You know, and it's just talking about some of those different things. And then it goes to now he's talking to Jesus. And then it talked about his 15-year-old son who shows up and who's going through problems in his life. And he, and he came in and his dad was talking to Jesus. And he said, you know what we can do? We can talk to Jesus. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking at people that maybe I don't look like and maybe that, that don't make up the broader part of our church. And you know what? I'm sitting there inside my heart's burning inside of me. And I said, I don't care. I don't care if you have a man bun. I don't care if you have long hair. I don't care if you have tattoos. If you are leading people to Jesus and if you are passionate about the glory of God, that's what this life is all about. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink. It's not these side issues. It is the glory of God in every single area, in every single aspect of our lives. And that's the point of this passage. Verse 21 gives us a great example of where we should limit our liberty. I think that this passage gives us a lot of help on how we view things and how we, we let the Bible speak and how we understand that people are individually accountable to God. There's a whole lot that we've seen here, but also verse 21 gives us a really good example of where we should limit our liberty. Look what it says again. It is good neither to eat flesh. And what are those next four words that he says there? Nor to what? nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Now, as I'm going through this, I just say, why, why did he have to go and throw wine in there? Why, why does that have to come up? And, you know, as, I, as I've been thinking about this, you know, I've mentioned week number one. I said meat and days and wine. And guess what I did not mention on week one? Wine. And last week we talked about meat and days and wine. And guess what I did not mention on week number two? Wine. And as we've gone through week number three, you know what I did not want to bring up today and talk about? Wine. And one of the areas is, number one, I don't, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to be taken out of context. I want my heart to be clear and right on all of this. Another thing is, I probably am lean to the weak on this side of things because I wish with all of my heart that the Bible said, thou shalt not partake of alcohol at all. 
But you know what the word for wine that's used here is also the same word that's used for wine in Ephesians 5.18 where it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, which is also the same exact word for wine for what Jesus turned the water into at that marriage, which was his first miracle, which is also the same exact word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy when he's talking to Timothy and he's saying that pastors should not be given to wine and deacons should not be given to much wine. And it's the same exact word, and it's not talking about grape juice. It's talking about the fermented, uh, fermented grape that becomes alcoholic. So does the Bible fully endorse and say that it's okay to drink? I think the Bible also is very clear in other parts where it says, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived by it is not wise. And for me personally, it's never been a hard decision I want to stay away from it. I, I am weak in the flesh. I have, I have uncles that I have seen destroy their family as a result of alcohol. I have counseled people. We have an addiction recovery program here on Friday nights. I, I was looking at statistics. It's anywhere between on an aggressive number, one out of every four Americans struggle with an, a, a, a drug, a, a, some sort of an addictive substance issue. Anywhere from one out of every four to one out of every five. From 12 years old and higher, that's astronomical. And I also clearly understand that anybody who takes a drink of alcohol, they don't expect themselves to become an alcoholic, but it starts somewhere, okay? And all I'm saying is there's a whole lot of danger that's associated with it. And does the Bible emphatically say you should not drink? It doesn't say that. I wanted to say that, but it doesn't say that. So someone who might want to be strong in their liberty says, it's okay for me to do that. But how many of you agree that there's a whole lot of questions we should absolutely be asking ourselves before we go down that road? It would be foolish for Mark and Dan, who work in our recovery program, to get up there and talk about the liberty that they have in Christ to exercise something like that. That could be a stumbling block. I think it's foolish for parents to allow it into their home when you have children that are growing up. That's me personally. Those are some of the things that, that the conclusions that I've come to. But the point is, there is no doubt that something like alcohol could cause somebody else to stumble, somebody to fall off the cliff, somebody to be destroyed in their walk with God. And we ought to be very mindful of that because it's not about me and my freedoms and what I can enjoy. It's about the kingdom of heaven and lifting high the name of Jesus. And so all I say right off the bat is think big. We are the church. There is a sacred spirit that exists here. There are people that are lost and dying that need to know about a God in heaven who's graven them upon his hands, who will never forget them, who loves them, who went to a cross to die for them. And we should not bring ourselves into the equation, but we should keep it at that big part of how we can best honor and glorify God in all that we say and all that we do, how we can preserve the unity, how we can help and strengthen one another in our walk with God and in our faith. So think big. Secondly, pursue peace. If we're going to take care of that and preserve that sacred spirit, we've got to think big. We've got to pursue peace. Look at verse 16. We're going to back up just a little bit. He says this, let not then your good be evil spoken of. You know what he's saying to the strong? Don't let your liberty get in the way of unity. Don't, don't let it happen. Let not your good, what, what you may be writing, let it not be evil spoken of because you make too big of a deal about it and you forget about the bigger picture that we're all after something greater, pointing people to Christ. Then he says in verse 17, and this is our theme verse for this whole passage. He says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In eternity, we're not going to talk about these issues anymore. You know what we're going to be? We're going to be righteous, and there's going to be peace, and there's going to be joy, and God wants that to begin, and he wants that to start right now with one another. If we pursue every day of our lives righteousness and peace and joy, if we remember the fact that we're going to be accountable to God and only him one day, and we live as this could be our last day, as if we could step into eternity and to be in his presence, forever and we pursue righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, we can experience that sacred spirit, that unity, and God can be clearly seen. So look what he says in verses 18 and 19. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. <laughs> so if we keep our eye on the prize, we're acceptable to God and we're approved of men. 
And then he says in verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. Let us follow after the things that make for peace. Strong Christians pursue peace. There's a really big question that we have to ask before we go further. Am I weak or am I strong? What category do I fall in? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not going to take a poll. That would be kind of arrogant if we raised our hand and said, I'm strong, I'm weak. I'm not asking for that. But what I am asking, what, what would you answer that question? You know what my conclusion is? Am I weak or am I strong? Both. I'm both of those things. All along in my walk with Christ, there's somebody who's stronger than me and there's somebody who's weaker than me. That's true of every single one of us in here. There's areas that I may be strong in my liberty and there's areas that I may be weak in my liberty. And you know what? The same may be true of you and we might not see eye to eye on what those areas or come to the same conclusions, but all of us have different personal convictions and different personal standing uh, standards. So how can we mesh all of this together? Because don't we all want to be strong? Do you want to be a strong Christian that cares about your weak brothers and sisters, the lost world, and brings them along? That's where I want to be. So how do we mesh these together? I want you to go ahead and put the chart up, and I want you to just leave it up as I give three practical applications, okay? So I found this chart. I hope you can read it. It was awesome because to me it really sums up all of what we're talking about in Romans chapter 14 in the best way, and I have read and read and read and prayed and prayed and prayed, and I really like some of the conclusions that they came to. Okay, and I want you to write down three things on this, all right? So how do we pursue peace, okay? So if you have a phone, if you got a pen, write these three things down, okay? Number one, don't be a heretic. Don't be a heretic. Heretics distort the gospel. So if you look on the outside of this chart, you have a strong conscience and you have a weak conscience. But on the very outside of the chart, there's a word way down that says heresy, and you know what strong Christians do? They distort the gospel by saying, I have liberty to live however I want and do whatever I want because Christ has set me free. And you know what? He'll forgive me and there's mercy in Jesus. And so you know what they do? They use their liberty as an excuse for sin. And they use it to justify their lawlessness, their sinfulness, their immorality, whatever it is that they want to get into. And Paul says, that's nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. God didn't save you to leave you the way that he, you are. He saved you to transform you and to change you and to call you out of the works of darkness into his light. He wants us to live differently. So don't distort the gospel like that. Don't be a heretic and abuse your liberty. But all the way on the other extreme, on the far right side of the chart, is the weak. And you know how they distort their liberty? By becoming legalistic. By adding to salvation, by saying, yes, it's faith in Jesus, but also you have to wear this and you have to do this and you have to believe this. And you want everybody to dot your I's and cross your T's all the same exact way. And you add to the gospel and you can't fellowship unless everybody comes to the same conclusions. Paul talks a lot about that as he goes throughout the Bible. Legalism is wrong. That's heritage. It distorts the gospel. Salvation is by faith alone in Jesus. So don't be a heretic. Secondly, write this down. Don't be arrogant or judgmental. Don't be arrogant or judgmental. I brought a picture. Go ahead and put that first picture up there, Instagram, okay? Just leave this right here, okay? This is how a lot of strong believers are, right there. They just, okay, I'm not saying that they're heretics. They're not trying to make excuses up for their sin so they can go out and live however they want. But you know what they do? They, they flex their biblical, biblical positions, and they're like, you know what? The Bible doesn't say that tattoos are wrong. Tattoos are right. Just get over it. And they're just kind of arrogant, and they're judgmental about it, and they're just out there. They're just like flexing their stuff and making sure everybody's looking at them. All right? And you know what the weak do with a Christian like that? Man, they're, they're judgmental, aren't they? You're looking at that and just being like, what a fool. What happens if that guy falls? He's toast, Right? But go ahead, put the next picture up. Here's reality. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. And you know, to the weak side of things, the ones that would tend to be judgmental, the ones that, that tend to think that these people are just living absolutely frivolously and you're about to fall off the cliff, the Bible has a really strong foundation for the liberty that we have in Christ. And so the point is, 
Don't go out there and flex your muscles and flaunt your liberty and go around and saying, I can do this and nobody can stop me. Because no, God's saying, don't think about yourself. Live for others and live for me and live for my glory. And he's also telling the other side, don't be so judgmental about what they're doing and just thinking that they're just about to, to run off the deep end. No, the firm foundation of my word. Let that be your guide. Actually, get inside God's word. Don't just accept what you've heard from other people. Look at what the Bible says and come to conclusions for yourself on where we should stand and where we should fall. So you know what? We don't need to be arrogant or judgmental. That's the second thing. Don't be a heretic. And don't be arrogant or judgmental. How many of you agree that an arrogant and judgmental spirit inside the church of God can do a whole lot of damage? For meat, destroy not the work of God. For meat, destroy not the work of God. Don't be arrogant or judgmental. Here's the third thing. Magnify the gospel. Magnify the gospel. If you'll notice, the three in the middle as you get closer and closer the three in the middle are the attitudes that Paul's talking about. And you go from strong and weak and you blend it together in the middle, which is what magnifies the gospel. And you know what Paul's saying? Be fully persuaded. If God gives you the liberty to eat meat, then be fully persuaded that you have the liberty to eat meat. And if God hasn't given you the liberty to eat meat, then be fully persuaded not to eat meat. But look at one another and receive one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then not only that... The middle section is be flexible even. Be open-minded. Be flexible to, to maybe come back a little bit or be flexible to maybe come forward a little bit so that we can find unity and we can find a sense of, uh, of the bigger picture of what it is that we're after. And the ultimate goal is I have become all things to all people that I may reach some, that I might save some. That's what Paul says. And his attitude is absolutely tremendous. Magnify the gospel. You know what I say this morning? There are a whole lot of churches in this area. I talk to a whole lot of you that come and end up joining our church. And some of you move to this area and you're like, man, we have been looking for a church for like two years. Uh, you could go to a different church every single Sunday in this area and uh, for probably a year or two and visit different ones. And you know what I realize? There are all kinds of churches out there today that are far more conservative than we are. Their pastor this morning is in a coat and a tie. They just probably had a piano. They're singing only hymns. And you know what? It would be absolutely wrong of us to have an attitude and say, well, they're legalistic and they're missing the point. No, they love Jesus. And if his name's being lifted on high, then we need to rejoice that his name is going forward. And the same thing is true on the flip side of the, of the equation. A lot of you are like, man, there are people that are meeting at the beach today, and they're in shorts and T-shirts, and there's people that probably have the lights really, really dark, and fog machines, and lights, and a whole production, and you're like, man, those people have really gone off the deep end. But guess what? The pastor gets up. They might have sang the same exact songs we sang this morning. And the pastor gets up and preaches out of the same truth of God's word. And we have to be careful not to measure or judge based on the peripheral, based on meat and drink, but on the Holy Spirit of God and on the truth of his word. This is our foundation. And we, I just want to go back to, again, too. Satan has got to be laughing so, so, so hard when we go to a passage like Isaiah 49 and then all we do is talk about tattoos and if they're right or wrong. Man, I was looking at some of those statistics. They're absolutely staggering. You know that I think almost 50% of kids that graduate from high school, they, have, they already have um, severe anxiety and they have mental things that they're struggling with in their life. Around 50% of them already have experienced alcohol or drug usage. They're at a point in their life where their brains aren't even fully developed yet. I mean, frontal lobes for boys, that takes like till 25 years old. God help us. I got three of them coming up, okay? I mean, it takes a long time for those things to, to fully develop. And while our kids are impressionable, they're having all kinds of things shoved in their face. They pick up social media every single day, and there is influence on social media. There ought to be some things that we pay attention to, that, that we know who's influencing your children, is it you? Is it God's word? 
What is it? I mean, there's all kinds of things that are out there destroying the work of God. There are people that are dying and breathing their last breath and are going to spend all of eternity in hell. We cannot afford to be distracted by the things that don't matter, by the things that are of less importance, by the things that are not going to make up all of heaven and earth. We must lift high the name of Jesus. And I'm not saying we compromise on the truth. No way. I believe that this book is God's word from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 21 and the very last verse in the Bible. I believe that God created the heaven and the earth in seven literal days. I believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale, a real whale. That's not some parable, some fictional story. I believe that our God can do the impossible, like rise again from the grave. I believe that he can save and he can transform. I believe that if he says it's wrong, then it's wrong. And if he says it's right, that it's right. I believe it with every fire of my being. I don't want to ever compromise on the truth of this book right here, but I do want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I want his name to go forward, and I don't want to get sidetracked by things that do so much harm and damage, not just inside the church, but to the name of God. Last week, the same people that were asking me about what some of these issues that we're talking about they also, in the court, I just mentioned, some, some people talk about like what you should wear to church, and he mentioned to me that his grandmother was in town, but she wasn't sure if she wanted to go to church because she didn't, she didn't have any clothes. She only had jeans. She didn't bring church clothes. And he said, don't worry about it. Just come to church. And she's like, no, no, I can't. This is not someone that knows anything about our church. This is just somebody that has that understanding in their mind that, that you can't go to church unless you're dressed in a certain way. And he came out of his room in shorts and a uh, a shorts and a t-shirt or whatever. And she said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to church. And she's like, oh, really? And he's like, yes, and you should come with me. <laughs> and that's the whole point. Do you understand what we're trying to say here? Pursue peace, break down walls, break down barriers, make it about Jesus and the gospel and the greatest needs that we have. And let's unite and preserve that sacred spirit so we can worship God full of praise and devotion. Last, I got to go on. Live blessed. If we're going to preserve that sacred spirit, we must think big. We must pursue peace. We must live blessed. If you leave here with three things today, we want to preserve that sacred spirit. Think big, pursue peace, live blessed. Look at verse 22 of Romans chapter 14. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Your faith is between you and God. That's it. That's the biggest thing we have to remember. Our faith is between us and God. We give an account to him and only to him for ourselves. Every man's going to give an account for their own life and their own actions before God. So your faith is between you and God. Don't flaunt your freedom. Don't try to convert others to your way of thinking. And then he says, happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing that he alloweth. Be blessed in the freedom and the clear conscience that you have before God. Get up every day and thank God and praise God that he set you free from the law, that he saved you, that he walks with you, that he's inside of you, that you can have direct access to the throne room of God and experience every day of your life a taste of heaven on earth. Be blessed. And then he says in verse 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is pretty plain too. If you don't have a clear conscience before God, then don't do it. Bottom line, if God's not giving you a clear conscience, don't do it. It's not the eating that's condemned. This is important to understand too. It's not the eating that's condemned. It's the eating that's not in faith that is condemned. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you do not have a clear conscience before God and something that you are allowing or you're doing in your life, stop right there and don't do it. Listen and pay attention to your conscience. Your conscience is not infallible. It's not the Holy Spirit, but it is a tool that God's given you. And until you are able to have the faith, don't do it. And by the way, if you don't have the freedom, be blessed. Be blessed. You're not living in sin. You're saved. You got a relationship with God. Life is incredible. Just be fully persuaded and be blessed and live in the joy and peace and righteousness of the Holy Ghost. And now it's time to close this message. And do you know what I still feel? Tension. And do you know what I hate? 
tension. <laughs> I like when everybody gets along. I like when everything is simple and everything is clear. And you know what I've come to realize in my walk with the Lord and how I parent and in really and honestly every single area of my life that there is always going to be tension. And you know what? That tension is good. That tension's okay if it drives us to God, if it drives us to his word, if we say, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and he giveth to all men liberally. If we're getting on our face before God and we're crying out and saying, God, I need your help. I need wisdom. I need strength. I don't have all the answers. God, I want to walk in unity. I understand clearly that there's people that, that don't agree and see eye to eye with everything that I agree and see eye to eye with. And you know what I want more than anything? I want to find ways for us to be able to pursue peace and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want us to be able to be united around the big picture of what's going on. Hey, I think all of us need to be asking ourselves, what areas can I give in in? What areas can I grow in? It's both sides so that we mesh together and we're fully persuaded, but there's flexibility because I'm pursuing Christ and you're pursuing Christ and I'm pursuing holiness and I'm pursuing his name being clearly seen and you're pursuing holiness and you're pursuing his name clearly being seen and we're living on mission because we recognize we need to reach this world for Christ. And then I just close with this last thought though, but how much attention should all of this really receive? How much attention should all of this really receive? And I say, in these areas, we need to go back to where this all started at the end of chapter 13. And he says, it's high time to awake out of sleep. If every single one of us would, again, pursue righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, if we would cast off the works of darkness, if we would walk in the light and in the spirit of Christ, I promise you, as we're both approaching it as different angles and as we're both pursuing Christ, the differences are going to become less and less and the things that unify us are going to become more and more. And the things that aren't important are going to get further and further to the side. And the things that are important are. And there's going to be a sacred spirit. And God's going to be worshipped. And he's going to be praised. And souls are going to be saved. Just like what's been happening and taking place here at West Florida Baptist Church for 51 years. For God's honor and for God's glory.